morning. So welcome to our second sea day, which is, again, last time I, I, I said, you know, sea days are cool. For those who have not had as many as I might have, now you get it. Sea days are great. So let's give a woohoo for sea days. Woo! Yeah. Uh, that's a little weak, but I'll, I'll let you off. It's early. Uh, okay, so today I get to talk about Vikings, uh, and then there is an amazing host of lectures today, um, from art history following me uh, to a, you know a more, more of a nature uh, look at Canada, and then Alan comes in later tonight and talks about a big fish. Uh, and, and so as you look at it, there's just a lot going on. If you're here for meditation, it's actually at 10 o'clock in Torshaven. Feel free to, you know, sneak out. Uh, or you can just meditate on the Vikings. Go home. Uh, but I, I do like to have a kind of a theme. So today's theme is, is what you think about the Vikings right or not. So it's really to confirm or deny when you think of Vikings. So I have a meditation exercise to get us started. I want everyone to close their eyes and, and, and trust me, it's not, it's not a bad thing. So just kind of close your eyes and think of picture a Viking. So in your mind, if you close your eyes and you picture a Viking, think about what they look like, think about what they're doing. Um, you got that? Everybody has got their Viking? All right, so you can open your eyes now. So some of you, and I'm a, I'm a bit psychic, uh, and, and some of you saw Fabio with long flowing hair, and he was sauntering along, and, and, and mostly women, not all, mostly, um, we're, we're seeing that some, some had this violent marauder who, you know, was out there just hacking up people, and I do know who you are. We're keeping your names. Uh, so if, if you were thinking of that, some, I mean, some in the back, I think even thought of Fran Tarkington. I think that's what I heard back in the back. Uh, but, but some had football on their mind. It is spring training. You know, we're getting close. Uh, so, so was that right? When, when you think about Vikings, were, were they these handsome, uh, big-chested, tall, flowing-haired guys? Or were they these marauders that came in and raped and pillaged? Uh, or were they perhaps even sportsmen? And the answer is yes, they were all of those things. Uh, but, but were they as violent as we, we think about and talk about? And that's kind of what I want to look at. Now, this is, this is a replica. I know it looks like a painting. It's actually a photograph that's been kind of colorized, uh, but it is a replica of a Viking ship uh, that they put together to see if Viking ships were actually as seaworthy as we might have thought. Uh, so there is a replica out floating. It was built in the exact same way, the clinker built style of the Vikings. Uh, and this ship is actually seaworthy worthy and capable of Atlantic travel. Uh, so we're going to look at Vikings. We're, we're going to start with kind of who are they and, and how do we know who the Vikings are? What do we know about them, uh, their expeditions and set settlements, how did they get from place to place. Uh, many of us, when we think about Vikings, uh, if I were to ask you where are the Vikings from, I would get a lot of uh, Scandinavia somewhere. A and that's true, but they're also from other places. And where did they go? I mean, if we have a Viking era and all of a sudden we see these Vikings, where are they now? Uh, and I want to look at that. Uh, we're going to look at their daily life. We're going to look at kind of the legacy. What did Vikings give us? And then finally, just take a quick look and look at their traditions and legends. Uh, but before we do that, I have another exercise just to get you woken up and ready. Uh, we've already envisioned the Vikings. Now it's time to learn are you a Viking? Uh, and so I want everyone to take their hand, their ring finger hand on, on their right hand side, and look at your hand. Look at the ring finger area. If you have a pronounced hump on the left and right of your ring finger that comes towards the middle of your palm and connects, then you are a Viking. 
Uh, and the way to, to do that, if this isn't totally clear, is in our Viking Museum, right across or just before you get to the restaurant on the second floor. Uh, there's actually a picture of it, uh, and people who have it truly pronounced can't even put their ring finger down. That if, if they put their hand down, it kind of looks like this. Uh, but if you look there and you see a pronounced hump, the Vikings had a dominant uh, mutation that made these tendons large and tight. Uh, and it gets passed down from generation to generation. So it's one way that you can determine whether you're a Viking. So there you go. Any Vikings out there? Anybody see it as they? A few. All right, we're not quite sure. Visit the museum. You, you can find out some more. Okay, so what did the Vikings look like? And the answer is they really were tall, good-looking, blonde, uh, long, flowing blonde hair. And this is a picture of King Harold Fairhair. He's actually the, the guy standing. The guy sitting is his father. Uh, and this, this is done a few hundred years later, but it gives us an idea of what Vikings actually look like. Uh, and here he has that angular nose, European features, uh, long, flowing, blonde hair. Uh, they wear tunics. They had tights. Uh, they wore a belt. Um, and they had these, these beautiful handmade uh, shoes that, that they wore. So we, we get an idea of how Vikings looked through some of uh, the, the woven items that are left and a few of the drawings as well. And, and someone already asked me, did they wear helmets? Uh, and as you look at it, here are some, some examples. On the right, we have a much later picture, but it depicts Leif Erikson. Uh, on the left, Left, we have what was thought to be the first Viking helmet ever found. Uh, a few hundred years ago, uh, actually about uh, 170 years ago, um, they were dredging the Thames River in London. And when they were dredging, the dredges brought up this helmet, this Waterloo helmet. And immediately there, there was a craze in the media where the media was going, oh, we have now found the first true Viking helmet. It has those horns. We Sometimes we think wings, but here we have horns. Uh, and very quickly, everyone said, this is the Viking helmet. Wagner is riding the ring cycle, which becomes... A, a immensely famous, and his, his designer, his costume designer, Delpler, um, actually takes this helmet and turns it into the lead character Vikings helmet, and the whole world says, these are what are Vikings. They should have talked to a historian first, um, because this is not a, a Viking helmet from 900 to 1100 AD. It's actually a Bronze Age helmet helmet from 150 down to about 50 BC, roughly a thousand years before the Vikings. This is a Celtic helmet, has absolutely nothing to do with the Vikings, and yet we all associate Vikings with these winged helmets. Now, imagine swinging a big axe with some big thing sticking here. It just, you can't hack nearly as well. Uh, and, and so archaeologists are now definitively clear that there are not helmets with wings or with uh, horns on the Vikings. So for those from Minnesota, I am very sorry. These Minnesota Viking guys just aren't right. Uh, now, I, I, I would say that if you're maybe a cheesehead, if you're from Wisconsin and you're a Green Bay fan, now you can go up to the Minnesota guys and go, yeah, no. Uh, but so as you look at it, Viking helmets looked like well, what we had with Leif Erikson. They, they were four pieces that were riveted together, uh, and that was really what a Viking helmet was. Sometimes they had a nose piece, but they did not have wings or Horns. Uh, so what do we know? Well, we know from archaeology, which is how I was trained. Uh, classically, I'm an Egyptologist. But, but when, when we do a dig, uh, you're looking for artifacts. You're looking at trash heaps. You're looking at where, where they traded. So you can find out a lot when going through archaeology. You can't find out 
everything. Uh, but we now have two boats that have been found from the period. Uh, before about um, the 1880s, uh, everything we knew about Viking ships came from drawings. We had some drawings, some of them rudimentary, uh, but we weren't sure exactly how seaworthy they were or how uh, well built they were. And then in the 1880s, this ship from Norway was found. It gives us a true understanding of what a clinker built ship looks like. If you want to see one up close, I have a homework assignment. No tests, but there is a little homework. I want you to go to the bar on the first floor. The bar on the first floor is a clinker built bar. So you can have a drink, look underneath and go, I'm just doing research. Uh, and you can actually see how a clinker built boat is put together. They also had an affinity for dragons. A and and it, there, there's no real evidence that they believed in dragons, but they definitely had a mystical uh, component. And when they made these clinker built ships, often they would put dragons on the front. And a dragon on the front, it was thought to scare the sea, that we're, we're so fierce and so ferocious that if our boat is there and the dragon is on the front, then any sea monsters will see that we are even more fierce than they, and the sea will calm and give us a nice uh, way to go. It was also thought that the Vikings were both traders and warriors, and if one of their Viking ships was coming to shore and the head of the dragon was covered, then we're here in peace and we're going to trade with you. But if you see the clinker built ship coming to shore and the, and the head of the dragon is shown, then we're not coming in peace, we're coming to raid. Now, why you would tell them that in advance, I don't know, but that's what they say. Um, how do we know these things? We talked about Snorri Sturluson last lecture. Snorri gives us the written account of the Vikings, uh, that, that most Vikings really didn't write much. In fact, that's why when you go, where did they come from and where did they go? We go, yeah, I don't know, because they didn't write their own history. They weren't big writers. They, they, they did do some, some stuff we're going to talk about, but until Snorri comes along, and Snorri lives in Iceland. He doesn't even live in, in the homeland of the Vikings. Um, we don't know. So who's writing the history of the Vikings? It's those guys that they were raping and pillaging. So, so clearly the history that we get is from England and Scotland and France who are writing about the horrible side of the Vikings. We get a one-sided picture until Snorri come, comes along. So Snorri gives us these sagas, these soap opera stories of Viking heroes who go out. This is where we learn about Thor. This is where we learn about Odin, the god. All that Marvel comic movie stuff comes from Snorri Sturluson. Uh, we also hear about Eric the Red and his son Leif er Erikson. And many thought that these were just tall tales that he made up to entertain folks. Uh, and yet what archaeology has now been able to show is that most of Snorri's tales of history are actually really close. Uh, so it is nice to, to see his stories. And he gives us a lot of what we consider to be English. Uh, for instance, uh, what is the hump day of the week? Mike, 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 Mike. What is it? Wednesday. And what day is that in Old English? Woden's Day, which is Odin's Day. So Wednesday is actually named for the god Odin. And so we have in our weekdays a god. What about the next day of the week? Which is Thor's day. And what about the next day of the week? Friday, which is 
Freya's Day. So we have three different Norse gods in our weekday calendar. Uh, so many words from the Viking language actually get to assimilate into English, so much so that when we get to Iceland, Iceland has actually preserved what they consider to be the ancient Icelandic Viking dialect. And, and they'll, if you take, and this is a shameless plug for Viking, if you take the Viking cruise to Iceland, which everybody should do, uh, see how I kind of worked that right in? Uh, that if, if you go to Iceland, they're very, very proud of the Icelandic lang language. And they'll say that if a Viking were to be alive today, they could actually converse with them. So they feel that they have kept true Viking language alive. Uh, and so Snorri gives us a lot of tales. But we also have stones, and these stones have runic writing on them, which is an ancient Viking um, cursive, if, if you will. And, and in doing so, on one of the run, run, runic stones called the, the Gelling Stone, because it was found in a place called Gelling, it talks about Denmark's birth certificate. Basically, the crowning of Harold Bluetooth, who has the conquest of Norway and Denmark. Uh, and he creates the Viking or a secured Viking nation. And they talk about it there. But on the right-hand side, um, over time, the Viking actually adopted Christianity, and here we have a painted reconstruction of the gelling runestone depicting Christ. Now, as you look at it, you see some interesting uh, runic writing, but what's even more surprising is on the back of that, it actually has what they thought to be Satan. So on the front of this rock, you have Christ. On the back, you have Satan. And then as archaeologists began to look more closely and read, be able to translate what the runic, on the front is Christ, and on the back is the god Loki. And the god Loki is really the god of mischief. And you wonder, why is it that they're really assimilating their own Norwegian background in gods, but adopting Christ and kind of putting them together? Uh, and so on these runestones, we not only have writing, but we also have pictures that help us to understand, at least in tidbits, what they were thinking. In addition, we have these silver hordes of, uh, or these hordes of silver. Now, how that works, and after this, you're all going to want to go out and get a metal detector, because um, the Vikings would go off in the summer and trade and raid. Well, if you're going to take off, you don't want your neighbor coming into your house while you're gone and getting your silver, and silver was the primary commodity of wealth, and you also don't want to take it with you, because as you go out, you're hoping to bring back a bunch of more silver. So what do you do? You go out to the backyard, you take three pace, paces left of the big tree, and you dig a hole and you put your silver. Well, what happens if you don't come back? Now you've got all these holes or hordes of silver all over Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. So much so that people were buying uh, metal detectors and going around and trying to find them. And, and it's, it, it's, it's illegal. I mean, you're not allowed to go out and do that in somebody's backyard. Um, and, and so the government was trying to make a big push for people to stop this process. So to do it, the media gets involved. And here in Sweden, this guy's on camera, and he has the little earphones, and he has his Geiger counter, and he's going around, and he's on camera, and he's saying, you know, and lots of people go to open fields like this with their Geiger counter hoping to get rich. And all of a sudden, his little Geiger starts to zit, 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 and everybody gets excited, and he's on camera, and he starts to dig, and he finds one of the largest hordes ever found of silver, and he's on camera, so he can't keep it, uh, which... I mean, that's the real travesty of this. So this, this actually is the spilling hoard that he found. Uh, it, and, and what it tells us archaeologically is we're able to go in and we're able to see what types of, uh, of silversmithing did they do as Vikings. But even more importantly, if a, if a coin from Asia pops up, 
It's like, well, how did that happen? Well, it shows that this Viking group was actually trading with the Silk Road at that time. Uh, we find things from Europe. We find coins from Italy. Um, so you're able through archaeology not just to see beautiful jewelry, but you're able to find work that was done in other areas. Uh, another one, you would think it's over, but there was this little girl in April of this year who went out and found 300 coins in a silver stash uh, in a field near her house. So it is still happening today. I was on the British Isles uh, cruise just a few weeks ago, uh, and I woke up one morning, and it was low tide, and I saw three people, no less than three, out with Geiger counters walking around the river. So Hopefully, they're still finding stuff, but they did as far as April. Uh, we also find archaeology when we're looking at their villages. This is a reconstruction uh, of what a Viking village looked like in Norway. Uh, you can see that they do have these long houses. Uh, they had communal piers where multiple families would be able to keep their, their boats. And they are so close to the water, the entire economy revolved around drying fish and trading it um, for silver and other precious items. So this is what a uh, town looked like. And then you go, well, why, why did the Vikings go to England and go to Europe and go to other places? And it's especially when it looks like this, this is gorgeous. Uh, and if you haven't been to Norway, another shameless plug, it, it, is, it is a beautiful place. Um, and so if you go to Norway and you look at it with all the mountains and lots of trees uh, and roughly 3% arable land, and really bad winters. So if you look at it, it's a harsh environment, and it is hard to grow enough wheat to sustain a very large society. Now, if you come over to Denmark, there's a bit more arable land, but the winters are still very tough. And, and what most believe today is that in that 900, the 10th century, we were going through a global warming. And so from the 10th to the 11th centuries, global warming is happening, and with global warming came an increase in population. With an increase in population, they then were overrunning their resources and had to look outside of the traditional Viking lands for a place to get additional resources and settle. Because if you were a Viking and they have four children, instead of saying, whatever is mine, I split four ways, it's whatever is mine goes to the oldest. The other three of you have to figure it out. So they're sending them in other places to conquer and to assimilate into lands in order to get out of this harsh Norwegian environment. So most believe it was a, a growth berm or a, or a population spurt uh, that led the Vikings to reach out. So what do we think today? We think that the Vikings were explorers. They were definitely looking for other lands and other markets. They were pioneers. They came up with new ways to trade, new ways to build boats. Uh, they were innovators. They, 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 they were able, they were smart. They were able to figure it out. They were settlers. And really, most importantly, the reason why nobody says, I'm a Viking anymore, it's because when they went into England, they assimilated. They married, they, they found the farmer's daughter, and instead of imposing Viking culture like the Romans, the Romans came in and said, you guys don't have a clue. We're going to do it the Roman way. We're going to create the Roman style of government. The Vikings didn't do that. They came in and said, I'm okay with whatever you guys do. If you're Christians, well, I'll be Christians. We'll keep Loki because he's kind of cool. But, but, uh, and maybe, maybe the cross will turn into Thor's hammer. I don't know. But, but they assimilated for the most part into local culture, and that's why we don't think of Viking culture uh, as existing and mo moving forward. So really, kind of expeditions and settlements. Um, we look at Denmark, Norway, and Sweden as the three big Viking homelands. So the Norwegians up there on the top left, I will see if my little handy-dandy 
There it is. Okay, so we got Norway up here. The the Nor Norwegians first went west, and they went over to the Orkney Islands and to the Shetland Islands, what is now part of Scotland. Then they continued west, and they went over to Iceland and colonized there. They went over to Greenland, uh, had a great marketing scheme in Greenland, finally went over, and now there is definitive archaeological evidence that the Vikings were the first European uh, to land in North America. Uh, so they found Vineland uh, and others in North America. That was a, a hostile environment. They were not able to trade, and the First Nations folks that were there were just as violent and pushed the Vikings back out. So that was a short-lived set settlement. Uh, and then the Norwegian Vikings came down to Scotland. They came down to France. They came into the Mediterranean. So in many ways, the Norwegian Vikings are the ones that we think of as Vikings. Now, one of the things I love is I mentioned that runic writing. They tended to leave graffiti all over. Uh, and for a long time, people didn't even know it was there. Uh, and, and what would you write if you were writing graffiti? You might write, I love mom. But what did they write? They wrote here, uh, Ingergith is the most beautiful of all women. That's pretty cool. Now, a little more vulgar guy comes in, and, and, and he actually writes Thor bedded Helga. Uh, he doesn't use bedded, by the way. Uh, so they, they, are, they, are, they, they, they are amorous. Um, but but they're they're talking about local women, so they come in and they trade and they go. She's kind of cute, uh, and they settle. So the 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 uh, the um, Denmark Vikings come in and they're really colonizing the eastern part of England and the eastern part of Scotland. You you may go well. I don't remember hearing about Vikings come coming in, but if you were to use two words to talk about ancient England. Ideas, a people group, English are blank, blank, Anglo-Saxon. Angles are Viking descendants from Germany and Denmark. Saxons, Viking descendants from Denmark and Germany. So when we say that the English are Anglo-Saxon, we're actually saying the English are Viking. Uh, so when the Anglo-Saxons moved into Great Britain, or what is now Great Britain, they moved the Celts further to the west. Ultimately, the Celts become the dominant group that are in Ireland, but you still have Viking influences in Ireland as well. So all of Great Britain and Ireland uh, are very much genetically tied to the Vikings. And then we have the Swedish Vikings who come over to Russia and actually are going down the Russian rivers all the way to the Black Sea and Constantinople, where even in Hagia Sophia, this beautiful church that is in Constantinople, uh, you see Viking runic writing where someone wrote their names and said so-and-so was here. Uh, so no pretty women in Hagia Sophia, but, but they do write their, their names. So we know that the Vikings came all the way that far. Now, when we think about Russians, Russians are actually genetic Vikings as well. Uh, to be Russian is to be Rus, and Rus is a Viking word that means rowing. So those who row are Rus, and so the Russians are actually Vikings who rowed down the river. Uh, so even the term Russian comes from the Vikings. Vikings came all the way into Greece. Uh, there were two lions. Uh, has anyone been on a Viking cruise to Athens? All right, a few of you guys. When we go to Athens on Viking, see, I see how I just kind of slide that right in. Uh, uh, it, it, we, the, the, we, we dock in a little town called Piraeus, which is the port just under Athens. And there used to be these two beautiful big lions that guarded the port. And so some Vikings came in and actually put graffiti all over those lions. And then the Venetians came in and sacked Athens, took the lions back, 
back to Venice, and those lions now sit in Venice in front of the armory. So if you're ever in Venice uh, on a Viking cruise, uh, then um, then go see these lions. Find the armory. Uh, it's a little bit out of the way. You've got to go, I don't know, 100 yards uh, off from where the boat tenders in. Uh, but you can see the lions, and actually you can still touch the lions. They haven't even roped them off. And you can run your finger along where these runic writings are. And on the lions, what did they write? Not that Thor did something to Helga, but he did say, I miss mom and I want to go home. So on those, it actually has the I'm homesick and would like to get out of here. So the Vikings are moving all over. And, and really, when is this happening? And we would say that the beginning of the Viking era starts in 793 A.D., that at that point, uh, we actually have three Viking ships that come in to the, the beach here in a place called Lindisfarne. Uh, and they come up to the monks and they demand all of the gold and silver. And the monks say no. And sadly, the Vikings exterminate almost every single monk, which is why the church begins to write about the Northmen, which become the Vikings. And this is why we think of the Vikings as being so violent. It's because the church put out a huge campaign of writing how horrible these people are. Now, they were horrible. They did kill all of, of the monks. But that uh, they came in, uh, and if you're a Viking, and if you're looking for gold and silver, what better place than to go to a church, especially if you're pagan. I mean, it's the church that has all the stuff. So they came in, uh, and we have this drawing on one of the gravestones, and a prayer pops up. And all of the monasteries in Europe began to pray every night, spare us, O Lord, from the fury of the Northmen. Uh, and so we get this ongoing idea of violence uh, from the church that these North men cannot be trusted. Uh, so how does it kind of work out? This is a different way of look, looking at it. Uh, if we go to uh, that Norway, Sweden, Denmark area, and then we move kind of to these orange areas where uh, by the 9th century they've expanded and colonized into Russia, uh, and then as in to the eastern side of England, and then by the 10th century and the 11th century, they're really all over the coastal areas of the North Sea. So you can see the influence of where the Vikings go, and you can see why there is just so much genetic crossover uh, between the Vikings and what we would consider to be English or French uh, or even German, uh, that the Vikings had a tremendous amount of impact as they came in. Now, if we see it, uh, how did they live? And this is, again, from, um, I took this a few weeks ago uh, when I was uh, up on uh, the British Isles cruise. And, and as you see this picture, this is from a place called Jarlshof in the Shetland Islands. And the picture shows us that longhouse, that communal house that is distinctive of the Vikings. Uh, any farmers out here? Nobody. Okay, every now and then we get a dairy farmer. Um, the way the houses were, were built is on the right, you'll see a little indent, and that's called a J channel. We still use them today in dairy farming. So on the right hand side of the house is where you kept your livestock. It not only kept them safe during these harsh winters, uh, even in Shetland Islands, the winters are incredibly harsh. Uh, so you would live with your animals. The center section of of um, this, let's see if I can make that work. There we go. The center section here is where they lived. And then the left section was the kitchen. And they had two open fires, one in the kitchen and one in the living area to keep them warm. Uh, so these longhouses is how they lived. 
Uh, and then uh, this is a reconstruction as we move to La Onza Meadows, which is in New Newfoundland, um, showing Leif Erikson. Leif Erikson is in front of a church in Iceland on the left. On the right is actually in Newfoundland, um, showing a reconstruction of the longhouses that were found. And it shows that they would use wood, if wood was available. They would use sod if sod was available. They would use stone if stone was available. So the exterior of these longhouses shifted while the interior stayed the same. Uh, here is the clinker-built boat that, that was found. Uh, they did it in a really unique way for the time. Not only did they overlap boards, giving it better seafaring ca capabilities. It was slower, but it was more stable. But they also would put sheep's wool between the planks, which added an additional layer of protection that other ships didn't have, which is why they took on water so much. This was much tighter. And then they began to use the rivet. They would actually be able to take a nail and bend it back, and that allowed, again, for better protection in the open sea. So as we look at these, they had a shallow draft, uh, which gave it stability. They were fast for the time, which meant five knots, sometimes up to six. They had a center mast with one sail, so it wasn't all rowing. They could row. Uh, it was maneuverable, but it was still light enough that they could port it, especially on rivers between one river or the other. In the Shetland Islands, we actually have evidence that they would go on one side of the island that was calm and create a village and then port over the island to the other side in order to set out to sea instead of having to go all the way around the Shetland Islands. Um, then if we look at from invaders to citizens, they did tend to intermarry. They didn't necessarily bring women from Norway, but they would stay and become farmers in different spots. Uh, there was linguistic crossover. We talked about the days of the week. There was economic integration. They showed the local populations how to trade. Uh, there was cultural assimilation. Here is a stone that shows Loki on one side and has Jesus on the other. If you look closely at, at the head of Loki, uh, Loki's head is definitely looking like Satan. I mean, we've got horns coming out. Uh, we've got a kind of an icky look looking guy, but Loki is the god of mischief. So they, they take Jesus and Loki and kind of pair them together, uh, and that is the religious adaptation. Now, in that first exercise where I asked you to kind of envision Vikings, uh, some of you probably saw a Viking taking a woman by the hair and dragging her to his boat to have his way with her. And, and that, well, I mean, it probably did happen. But, but, but not as much as you think, uh, that, that the Vikings actually were very desirable. Um, and and so some of the things that we find from the church writings is they combed their hair every day. So where the English, you know, they, they didn't comb it very much, and it was all kind of tang tangled, and yet the Vikings, every one of them is found with a comb. Uh, and so they combed their hair and kept this long, flowing, blonde hair really attractive. They washed every Saturday, whether they needed it or not. Uh, I mean, what's not to like about that, women? I mean, a guy who actually combs, well, who has hair, uh, who combs his hair and takes a bath. Uh, in England, that was unheard of. They were stinky. I mean, uh, and so you have a guy, and he changes his clothes. I mean, this is a catch. Uh, and, and one of the monks says that, that these Vikings came in, and they undermined the virtue of married women and even seduced the daughters of nobles to be their mistresses. So the, the, the written evidence is not that they came in and just plundered their way into a family. They actually 
the girls were going, Daddy, I kind of like this guy. Uh, and so they are assim- assimilating in and, and changing some, some of the values because the English guys have to now start taking baths. Uh, so what else is on the daily life? We've talked about these long houses and how they used thatched roof. They used mud roof. They used all kinds of different ways to make them, but the general structure is the same. Also, the role of women. We talked a bit about women, but but the Vikings had a unique view of women at the time. They actually valued women. A woman could get divorced if she wanted to. A woman could inherit property. Uh, a woman, if if the the Lord left or the, the 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 head of this Viking tribe goes out to sea, it's not his assistant who becomes in charge. It's the wife. The wife is in charge of the village when her husband leaves. So women were given a tremendous amount of authority. And, and somewhat similar to today, the women were, in, were involved in all the finances. That the woman actually wore all of the silver that she could carry as a sign of wealth, but also to keep it safe. We don't want him heading over to the bar. I mean, she kept the wealth uh, and she kept the home. Oh, I just have a, what, what am I downloading? Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, the women um, were really in charge when a man was not and had more rights than anywhere else at the time in Europe. So this Viking valuation of women actually spreads as women uh, or as the Vikings assimilate into culture. Uh, we also have what they, these op- open fires, uh, they used wooden uh, cooking utensils and wooden bowls, uh, and they drank often uh, ale and mead from these horns. Now, mead is something that is made from honey, and honey is central to a Viking population. They bring this idea of fermenting honey uh, and creating mead from it, but they, they, were, they were big in the use of honey for sweeteners. So we have a lot about food and drink. Currency, as we've talk, talked about, is not coinage. Currency is the weight of silver and gold. Everyone had a scale, but we do find coins that they're using, but they're using the weight of the coin. Now, at the bottom is a very late period Viking coin uh, that comes out of Scandinavia. It's actually in the York Museum at Yorkshire, uh, and it shows a Viking and it shows a sword. So there is some late minting that does take place, but for the most most part, it's these hordes of silver that you see on the right. Uh, we also have carvings. They were master wood carvers. Uh, and these are from two different churches. The one on the left is a stave church that we visit when, when we go to Norway. Uh, and it is a great story of a guy named Fafner, Sigurd, and Regan. Now, Fafner is this wealthy brother, and he is a bit of a miser. He has this huge hoard of silver, and he frets that someone's just going to take his silver, and he's constantly going back and forth, going, someone's going to steal it from me, so much so that he turns into a dragon. So he turns into a dragon, and he sits on his silver, and he breathes fire. Well, his brother, Regan, is like, yeah, we, 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 we can't have this. So he goes to a guy named Sigurd, and he talks Sigurd into killing his brother, killing the dragon. And if he eats his heart, he will gain knowledge. So uh, they sit down, and this is a picture of Sigurd and Regan, and they're sitting at an anvil, and they're making the sword that would kill a Viking. And Sigurd says, you know, we, we need a really special sword because a guy who's been magically turned into a dragon, he's not going to die easy. So they, they make a sword, and Sigurd takes the sword, and he slams it against the anvil, and the sword breaks. And he goes, yeah, that's not going to kill Dragon. So they do it again, and he slams it, and yeah, that's not going to work either. And so Regan then thinks, you know, Odin, Odin had a sword, but I had heard it was in pieces. And he goes and finds all the pieces of Odin's sword, and he puts them together. And they take the sword, and they hit the anvil, and the anvil breaks. 
And it's like, that's going to kill a dragon. Uh, so as the story goes on, uh, they go out, they kill the dragon, they eat the dragon's heart, and they gain knowledge. Now, there are, there are two parts to this story. I mean, it's just a fun story. But, but there are two parts of it that, that are important. And uh, the first part is, does this preserve the creation of steel or iron? have, you know, this knowledge that they gain by eating the heart and this sword that is now stronger, uh, have they now created a new metal? And it's very possible. But going back to the beginning of my story, where is this? It's in a church. Why is this in a church? It is clearly mythology, and yet it is in a Christian church. Uh, and so we, we find that they're blending their, their stories uh, into Christianity, so much so that all over this stave church are mythological scenes that have been carved into the pews. And so this is on the end of one of the pews. On one of the doors, we actually have a lion. Everybody can see, of course, that's a lion. Uh, with a really long neck intertwined and fighting another. Uh, and most thought, well, this must be Armageddon uh, because you have these two mythological creatures fighting it out at the end of the world. And yet it's not. It is in a Christian church, but it is the underworld fight that happens in Norse mythology called Ragnarok. Um, then we have different pieces of textiles that we learn about the Vikings. Uh, what I love here, I mean, not only is it beautiful, but on the right-hand side, you have guys who are riding horses attacking a village. And here is a Christian church, and they have bells. And look, look at these guys at the bottom. I mean, those are some serious faces who are ringing the bells as fast as they can to say that they got bad guys coming. So we get a scene into what raiding parties look like and how people responded. We also get a chance to look at jewelry. They were master creators with gold and with silver. Uh, and uh, then we have the, these rune stones, and I've talked about the gelling rune stones. This is from Harold Bluetooth, whose name is not Harold Bluetooth. His name is, is actually Gor Gormanson, uh, but he had a rotten tooth. So he, he actually is called after his poor tooth. I don't know how I'd feel about that. Um, impact on Chris Christianity. I, I talked about the stave church there in the middle. This is the type of church they used in Norway for the Vikings as they're creating, or at least as they're adopting Christianity. Uh, they blend Thor. Thor has this hammer. And so what they do is they create Thor's hand or hand, uh, hammer, but they add a little bit to the end, and now you have a Thor's hammer, Jesus cross. Uh, but you still keep the wolf on it just because. Um, and we get these ideas of a Thor's cross uh, in multiple ways that they preserve both. Now, this is looking at Harold Bluetooth. Uh, and many of you may have noticed that on your phones, you have something called Bluetooth, and you go, well, is that connected? And the answer is absolutely it's connected. Uh, that when they were creating this idea, they had an idea that they wanted to connect all the electronic devices together. And they, they tried to come up with different names. So they came up with a code name of Bluetooth. That was the secret project. And when they went... Um, to trademark, they, the name they wanted was like transpersonal connection, and that was not trademarkable. Uh, and so they came back to the code name and said, we're just going to call this thing Bluetooth. Why? Because Harold Bluetooth united all of Scandinavia under one crown, and Bluetooth unites all of our phones together. So what kind of a logo do we want to use? Well, let's go back to Runic. Harold, H, Bluetooth, B, you take the two symbols and you put them together and you have the Bluetooth symbol. So the Bluetooth symbol on your phones is actually runic for Harold and Bluetooth. We also have Harold I of Norway. We saw his picture. He is considered to be the father of Norway. And then we have this Swedish coin uh, rep representing a united Sweden. So what is happening as we move into the 11th and the 12th centuries is people are beginning to identify themselves as Norwegian. Sweden, 
Danish. They don't identify as Viking anymore. And so very, very slowly, but with this change, we see the Viking idea vanishing. Uh, and then ultimately we see 1066 as the end of the Viking era. And at 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock, I'm going to do some hallway tours going through the Bayou Tapestry, where this is from. And it talks about a, a, a battle or a period where it is Viking on Viking on Viking violence. And as the Battle of Hastings in 1066 is concluded, we no longer have Vikings. We only have English and French and Norwegian. Uh, so this battle is thought to be the end of the Viking era. And the Viking cruise line thought that was so important that we patterned the entire ship after this one tapestry. If you look at the floor and you look at the cushions and you look at the wall and you think about the wood in your cabin, all of that comes from this tapestry. So the Viking cruise line is truly inspired by the Battle of Hastings and the Bayou ta Tapestry. So with that, have a great day today. I hope you learn a lot and have fun. Thank you for coming.